Last year, Bedtime Stories for Insomniacs won Best Fiction Podcast at the People's Choice Podcast Awards. This year, we hope to do it again, but we need your help. Visit podcastawards.com at the link in the description and vote for Bedtime Stories for Insomniacs under Best Fiction and Best Male Host during the nomination period. And in return, I'll tell you a really cool story. Starting now. Welcome to this special presentation of the unabridged audiobook of Near Death, a rainy day investigation on the Bedtime Stories for Insomniacs fiction podcast. Near Death introduces Dr. Jennifer Day, anthropology professor and parapsychologist, to skeptical police detective Nate Rainey. It is inspired by the life and work of co-author Lloyd Auerbach and was originally brought to life as a screenplay by myself, Lloyd, and my longtime writing partner, Arnold Rudnick. In near death, Nate nearly loses his life during a robbery and is, in fact, clinically dead at one point. When he recovers, he struggles to make sense of information he seems to have gotten from a dream that helps him track down the robbers who shot him. Jennifer is convinced he had a near-death experience, but he remains skeptical, finding logical alternate explanations for what's happening. While Nate's on medical leave, Jennifer convinces him to join her on an investigation she's conducting for a woman who has an unwanted ghostly visitor. Their efforts end with them solving a decades-old cold case. So sit back and enjoy Near Death. A Rainy Day Investigation by Rich Hosick, Arnold Rudnick, and Lloyd Auerbach. Chapter 33 Nate sat in the passenger seat of Jennifer's van, belted in securely. They approached an intersection, and it appeared that Dr. Day was determined to go straight through it. You'll want to turn here, Nate suggested. Jennifer quickly consulted her side view mirrors cut across the mostly empty lanes, and barely made the turn as her worn tires squealed and slid across the pavement. Nate sat through the reckless maneuver unperturbed. Compared to Max's driving, she was a little old lady on her way to church. Would it reassure you to know I've never had a traffic accident? Not even a ticket? Jennifer asked. No, Nate replied. Though I suspect you've gotten more than your share of warnings. Jennifer became offended. What is that supposed to mean? It means that there are a few patrol cops who pull over women doing anything ticketable to flirt with them. Not something I ever did or endorsed, but I know what happens, and it must be frustrating for you. Jennifer relaxed. She was still on edge about the previous night's events. The glare the dean had given her as she left the dinner party was beyond any look of disdain she had seen from him in the past. Okay, I may have talked my way out of a speeding ticket or two. Nate smiled. So, judging from last night and the fact that movers were carrying your stuff away, I'm guessing there's a bit more to your relationship with the dean than just a typical teacher-administration conflict. Can't pull one over on you, detective, Jennifer said. Anything I can do to help? Nate asked. How could you help? He may have unpaid parking tickets or some building code violation at his home. That kind of stuff can tie a person up in bureaucratic knots for quite a while. Detective Rainey, I'm shocked that you would suggest such a thing. Yeah, I guess my partner's been rubbing off on me. I know I shouldn't want to boot his Mercedes, but I met the guy. What is his story? How do you know he drives a Mercedes? Jennifer asked suspiciously. Nate shrugged. I may have looked him up, he confessed. Thanks, she said. So, did you two date or something? Nate asked. God, no, Jennifer replied adamantly. We started as associate professors together. He was a big get from Columbia. I was a grad student who moved to the faculty after I was awarded my doctorate. There's a big East Coast-West Coast rivalry in the anthropology world. I had no idea it was so rough. Oh, you should see the registration line at the annual conference. You can cut the tension with a spoon. Nate laughed. I'll take your word for that. Anyway, it was clear from the start that he wasn't cut out for teaching. And almost the entire administration for the department were on the verge of retiring with no one waiting in the wings to take over. So, all he had to do was kiss the right butts, whisper in the right ears, and before you know it, the youngest dean in the department's history. So, what's he got against you? Nate asked. He doesn't feel there's a place in our field for the type of research I do. The ghost stuff. There's actually more to it than that, but yeah, the ghost stuff. 
Ever since I got tenure, he's been trying to get me to leave, trying to cut back my classes, criticizing me for associating the university with all my superstitious mumbo-jumbo. But I have one of the most popular undergrad classes across all the departments. It's the top elective among the engineering and computer science students, as well as many of the athletes. And before you ask, no, I'm not an easy A. Of course, now he has me tied to the loss of a major donor. That may sway some higher-ups. You think he set you up? I think he saw a win-win situation. Either he would get a big donation, or be able to scapegoat me. Wow, what a douche. It was Jennifer's turn to laugh. <laughs> it's strange to hear that from a man wearing a tie and jacket. I could have worn my Animal House t-shirt. It's got the, This situation absolutely requires a really futile and stupid gesture quote on the back. Jennifer laughed harder. I can't imagine you wearing a t-shirt with anything on it besides a Calvin Klein tag. You should see my collection of concert tees. I've got a great faux black velvet of Celine Dion. It's got the complete lyrics to My Heart Will Go On on the back. I cry every time I wear it. Stop, Jennifer warned as her laughter grew. I'm trying to drive. Stop, Nate said. No, you stop. No, stop here. This is the address, Nate told her. Jennifer looked around for a place to park and found a spot that would accommodate her van. That building over there. Nate pointed to an apartment building abutting the sidewalk. Jennifer peered through the windshield at the building. So, what's the plan here, detective? A little good cop, bad cop? Nate looked at Jennifer. We're just going to ask him some questions. No TV cop stuff. Nobody does that. It doesn't work. If you've never done it, how do you know if it works or not? Nate answered her with a raised eyebrow and then let himself out of the van. Jennifer followed him to the door of the apartment building. There was a row of buzzers with worn name tags next to the dirty buttons. He found the one for Jay Henderson and noted the name D. Collins was also still there. He pressed the buzzer, then waited. Nothing happened. Should we press all the buttons and see if someone lets us in, then go check out his place? Jennifer asked. Again, not doing any TV cop stuff, especially anything illegal like breaking and entering. Nate judiciously omitted mentioning he had done just that earlier that week. All right, Jennifer said, shrugging. I saw a little Indian place in the corner. Should we grab lunch while we wait for him to come home? Nate took a step back from the building and looked up to the third floor, trying to guess which apartment was Henderson's. He looked up and down the street, then turned around and saw Jerry Henderson jaywalking through the parked cars, carrying a tattered plastic shopping bag stuffed with groceries, and heading right for him. Henderson checked the traffic and walked across the street. He looked over at his building and noticed Nate staring at him. Jennifer realized Nate's attention was focused on something, and followed his gaze to Henderson, who stood frozen in the middle of the street. Is that him? She asked Nate. Nate nodded slightly, but he knew Jerry had made him. Now it was just a matter of waiting for Jerry to make the next move. Nate prayed he wouldn't run. A cab screeched to a halt next to Henderson, its horn blaring. Jerry looked at the cab, then back at Nate. Don't do it, Nate whispered under his breath. Henderson turned around and ran. Damn it, Nate said as he chased after Henderson. Jennifer watched Nate's pursuit, took note of where Henderson was going, and got into her van. Henderson had a good lead on Nate, and Nate was nowhere near his peak physical condition. The doctors hadn't cleared him for running yet, fearing it would aggravate his recovery. Instead of trying to chase Henderson down, Nate just tried to stay close enough to keep him in sight, hoping that the guy was at least as out of shape as he was. The street met up with a much busier thoroughfare, and Henderson, instead of trying to cross it, backtracked into a nearby alley that paralleled it. Nate followed and saw him turn down a junction. He jogged after him, hoping the man would make a mistake. Nate turned the corner and saw Henderson still running. Nate slowed down, feeling the painful effects of the jog on his shoulder. Henderson turned back, saw that Nate had given up and smiled. He turned up the speed toward another junction in the alley, just as Jennifer's van appeared. Henderson crashed into it. He bounced off the side of the van, falling backward, cracking his head on the pavement and spilling his groceries. He was dazed, but not unconscious. Jennifer got out of the van and stood over the stunned man. She looked down the alley and saw Nate walking briskly in her direction. Henderson managed to sit up. Blood was pouring out of his nose. He pinched it shut with one hand and looked up at Jennifer. Nate caught up and looked down at him. Geez, Jerry, that looks like it might be broken. Jerry looked over at Nate. Who are you guys? I'm Detective Rainey and this is... Nate hesitated, introducing Jennifer. He wasn't officially an active law enforcement officer, and he didn't want to entangle Jennifer in his little off-the-books investigation more than he already had. I'm his partner. Didn't your mother ever tell you to look both ways before you cross the street? She asked in a thick pseudo-northeastern accent. Nate looked at her quizzically. 
What you got in the bag there, Jerry? Jennifer asked. My groceries, he replied. Jennifer looked in the bag and pulled out a dripping carton of eggs. Looks like you'll be having omelets for lunch. What do you guys want? Henderson asked. I want to know why you're harassing Diane Collins, Nate asked. Diane? I'm not harassing her. That's not what she said, Nate told him. She says you got into her apartment and tried to scare her. You think that's going to make her come running back to you? I don't know what you're talking about. If she said I broke into her place, she's lying. Come on, Jerry. You can do better than that, Nate said. I'm telling you, if someone is bothering Diane, it's not me. I wasn't that hung up on her. Why was you running? Jennifer asked. Henderson paused before answering. I thought you guys were Jehovah's Witnesses. Jennifer and Nate exchanged a look. I hate those guys. I took a brochure from them once so they won't leave me alone, Henderson explained. Nate crouched down and looked Jerry straight in the eyes. I don't believe you, Jerry. I think you're still upset that Diane left you and is doing well on her own. I think you're having trouble making rent on that crappy apartment of yours, and you think if you can scare her, she'll come running back to you. Well, you think wrong. She didn't leave me. It was a mutual thing. We parted on good terms, and we're still friends, he said, echoing everything Diane had told him. Besides, I'm living with my new girlfriend now. Wouldn't be much work from Di if she did come back. You already moved in with someone else? Jennifer asked. Were you cheating on Diane with this woman? That's disgusting. Who are you, her new BFF? Jennifer was about to answer, but Nate cut her off. I'll be checking out your story, Henderson. And if I find you within a mile of Diane, you'll be heading toward your third strike. Look, I don't know where you got the idea I'd want to scare Diane. But I'm telling you, everything is cool between us. She got a great place closer to a job, and she's doing well in her career. I'm happy for her. Nate regarded Jerry skeptically. He didn't sense that there was any underlying feelings of enmity between him and Diane, but some men were good at disguising their feelings, lying to everyone about the true state of their relationships. It was possible he was being straight with Nate, but it was equally likely, in his experience, that his denials were just a performance. Yeah, we'll see, Nate added, staring down at Jerry until the man looked away. Jennifer placed the broken eggs back in his grocery bag and handed it to Henderson. Then she reached into her pocket, pulled five dollars from a collection of bills, and tossed it at Henderson. For the eggs, she said in her ridiculous accent. Henderson got up and started walking away, holding his nose tight with his head back to try to control the bleeding. What was that? Nate asked Jennifer. What, the accent? Pretty good, huh? I used to do a bit of dinner theater when I was in college. No, the money. Jennifer shrugged. I felt bad about the eggs. Wasn't sure if I was the good cop or the bad cop, though. You're not a cop, Nate reminded her. And where did you come from? How did you know he was coming this way? Oh, that was easy. I knew he wasn't going to cross Fifth. It's too busy this time of day, so I figured he'd try to double back around to the alley. Nate was impressed. Nice, he said. Thanks, Jennifer replied. Then she added, I saw it on TV. Nate shook his head. He walked around to the passenger side of the van. As he stepped on his right foot... A twinge of pain lit up his ankle. He almost stumbled. Are you all right? Jennifer asked. Yeah, I must have tweaked my ankle, Nate said. He had no clear memory of doing so, though. When he was running after Henderson, he was fine. And he only did a quick walk when he was catching up to him after he ran into Jennifer's van. Maybe the adrenaline from the chase had masked the injury until now. Do you need to see a doctor? Jennifer asked. No, Nate answered reflexively. Then he heard a voice in his head. Not as if someone was talking to him, but more like an echo. It was a familiar voice, but he couldn't place it. He could only make out a part of what was being said. Hot dog, Nate said aloud without thinking. He realized he was now sitting inside the van, and they were now driving down the street. Nate had no memory of getting into the van, let alone Jennifer starting it up and driving them out of the alley. Hot dog? Jennifer asked. What? You just said hot dog. Nate shook his head. Are you sure you're okay? You kind of tuned out of me there for a minute. I'm fine, Nate reassured her. Probably low blood sugar, Jennifer guessed. It's after lunch. A hot dog actually sounds good right about now. I didn't say hot dog, Nate protested. I think I saw a place that sells them next to that Indian restaurant. Nate grimaced and shook his head. If you want a hot dog, we're not going to some greasy hole in the wall. Head over to Soma Street, he said. I'll get you a hot dog to die for. Chapter 34 Diane exited the elevator, grocery bags in both hands. As she walked toward her apartment, she shifted one batch of bags from her right hand to her left, then fished out her keys from her purse to unlock the door. Her phone rang just as she fitted the key in the lock. 
She paused, opening her door to check the screen, which identified the call as work. She tapped to answer. This is Diane, she said, then listened while she squeezed the phone against her ear and shoulder and finished unlocking her door. Across the hall, Rose poked her head out and saw Diane juggling her groceries, phone, and keys. Diane, dear, what are you doing home so early? Diane turned around and offered Rose a neighborly smile. I can't talk now, Rose. Excuse me. Then, into the phone, she said, Sorry, you caught me just as I was walking in the door. Hang on for a second. She opened her door, entered the apartment, and set her bags down on the floor by the door and pushed it shut behind her. She opened her door, entered the apartment, set her bags down, and pushed it shut behind her, leaving the building busybody frustrated. Diane flopped down onto the nearest chair. She put the phone back to her ear. Okay, sorry about that. What's up? As she listened, she became aware of an unusual odor, or rather a combination of odors she couldn't quite place. She started to get up, but the person on the other end of the phone conversation said something that brought her attention back to the call. What? I just got home. I've been putting in 16-hour days for the last two weeks. Rob told me I could take the rest of the day off. You were there. Her demeanor shifted from exhaustion to frustration. I can't. I have people coming over this weekend, and I haven't been home long enough to do anything but sleep for a week. She closed her eyes and listened for a minute. All of that can wait until tomorrow, and if it can't, Eric can handle it. I'm not the only paralegal in the firm. Diane tried to open her eyes, but found the lids heavy. She rubbed the back of her neck, feeling a headache coming on. All right, I'll be there early, but I'm not staying past six. Goodbye. She could hear the voice on the other end continue to talk, but hung up anyway, and then turned the phone off. She took a deep breath and settled down into the chair, letting sleep overtake her. There was a crash from the kitchen. Diane awakened, startled. She leaned forward and started to raise herself out of the chair. She found herself lightheaded. Her vision was blurry and dim around the edges. She looked over toward the kitchen and saw something on the floor. Who's there? she asked. There was no answer. She reached for her phone, then remembered she had turned it off. She pressed the power button and the phone started its boot process. Suddenly, a part of her recognized the odor she had detected when she entered her apartment. It was hidden by some kind of floral scent, something like the rose-scented lotion she used. But still there, unmistakable. Gas. There was a gas leak in her apartment. The kitchen? Diane pushed herself to her feet and made her way across the living room to the kitchen. On the floor were the shards of a coffee cup. She looked over at the stove. There was a man standing there. She blinked, rubbing her eyes, and looked again. But the figure was still there. But then again, he wasn't. There was something strange. He seemed to be occupying some of the same space as her stove. And there was something else. It looked like he didn't have any feet. Diane stared at him. His face was pleading, desperate. Who are you? She asked. What do you want? He turned toward the stove. Diane noticed that the knobs were missing. She could hear the gas hissing out of the stove, but none of the burners were lit. She rushed to the kitchen window and tried to open it. She managed to get it open a crack and bent down to get some fresh air into her lungs. Then she looked at her phone. It was ready to unlock. She did so and opened the phone app and dialed 911 as she made her way back through the kitchen. The man was gone. She stumbled through the living room, the phone to her ear. She heard a voice on the other end identify itself and ask her what her emergency was. I have a gas leak in my apartment. Oakley Arms, 10th floor, apartment 10H. The voice recommended that she get out. I'm trying, Diane assured the operator. She dropped the phone and headed for the front door. She tripped over the groceries, fell to the floor, and banged her head against the door. Stars filled her dimming vision. She pushed herself onto her hands and knees and reached up for the doorknob. She grabbed it with both hands and twisted and pulled until it opened. Fresh air filled her lungs, but not enough to clear her head. Diane crawled out into the hallway, making her way toward the elevators, sucking in as much fresh air as she could. The elevator opened. A middle-aged couple exited and saw Diane on the floor. They rushed to her aid. There's a gas leak in my apartment, Diane told them. We have to get everyone out. Pull the fire alarm, the man instructed his wife. He nodded to the small red box across from the elevators. The woman pulled down on the alarm and a loud ringing filled the hallway. Some of the doors opened. Most people were likely still at work where Diane would have been if she hadn't demanded some downtime after working nearly around the clock for the last week. Can you walk? We should take the stairs, the man said to Diane. I think so, Diane replied. He helped her to her feet and held her by her arm. His wife grabbed her other arm and they started toward the stairwell. Wait, Diane said. Rose, I didn't see her come out. The old lady at the end of the hall? The wife asked. Diane nodded. 
The man left Diane with his wife and rushed toward Rose's door. Diane's door was open, and he covered his mouth with his sleeve reflexively when the odor of the gas grew stronger. He pounded on Rose's door. Rose, he shouted. Are you in there? There's a gas leak. We have to get out. He knocked again, then tried the knob. The door was locked. He knocked one last time, then hurried back to Diane and his wife. I think she's gone, he reported. Let's get out of here. The couple guided Diane to the stairs. Chapter 35 Nate and Jennifer wandered among the tail end of the lunchtime crowd, enjoying dishes from the array of food trucks and booths, set up serving a variety of gourmet street foods at the Soma Street Food Park. They stopped in front of a truck painted with photorealistic portraits of hot dogs, ornately framed as if they were hanging in a museum. The name of the truck was subtly displayed, as if carved in stone along the top. The art of the dog. Jennifer eyed the line of people, starting at the ordering window of the truck and disappearing around a corner. Is this really worth the wait? She asked. Oh yeah, Nate said. You'll never want a hot dog from anywhere else after you taste these. She makes the actual hot dogs herself, the buns too. Fresh baked every morning. I don't know what her secret is, but it's not like anything you've ever tasted before. Definitely worth the wait. They found the end of the line and took their place. More people quickly filled in behind them. Can't you use your badge to get us to the front of the line? Nope. Wouldn't insult the woman by trying. The line moved fairly rapidly, and Jennifer found out why when they reached the order window. There were five options on the menu. Each dog was paired with a side dish, and the menu explicitly stated that there were no substitutions allowed. What do you recommend? Jennifer asked Nate. Number five, if only for the sweet potato frites. Jennifer checked out the last item on the menu. It was advertised as a Windy City dog and consisted of a plump hot dog resting in a bun that was more like a cradle than the traditional hot dog bun she was used to. On top of it was a sort of salsa made from all the ingredients of a traditional Chicago-style dog. Tomatoes, dill pickle, a chunky pickle relish, coarsely chopped onions, sport peppers, all drizzled with brown mustard, then liberally sprinkled with something the menu identified as celery salt. Okay, sounds good, she said. Two number fives, Nate told the order taker, handing him two $20 bills and stuffing another ten into the tip jar. The cashier handed over two bottles of ice-cold sparkling water. Nate gave one to Jennifer. Wow, a $20 hot dog, Jennifer commented. Glad it's your treat. Trust me, it's as good as any gourmet meal you can get in a Michelin star restaurant. He directed her to a table a few yards away. How long does it take to get it? Nate shrugged. Could be a few minutes, could be an hour. She's an artist. You can't rush her. They sat down at a cafe table with an earshot of the food truck. Nate stared at it for a moment. All the surrounding noise was gone. He had an eerie feeling, and the notion that there was a voice at the back of his mind saying something he couldn't quite hear was back. He looked around, and from the corner of his eye saw a silhouette that was somehow familiar. He looked directly at the man. He dropped a few pounds, shaved his head, and grew a beard. But it was the fat guy from the robbery. Maybe. He couldn't be 100% sure from this angle. But there was something about the way he carried himself. Nate, what is it? Jennifer asked. With the sound of her voice, his ears opened up to the rest of the world. The chatter from the crowd flooded in. His eyes remained focused on the back of the man. Even with his attention devoted to the potential suspect, it didn't escape Nate that this was the second time in as many days when a seemingly random choice brought him within proximity of the men who shot him. First it was their recently vacated hideout. Now one of them was standing in front of him, possibly waiting for a hot dog from the very food truck where Nate had placed his order. No, it couldn't be. It was just a man who bore a passing resemblance to the fat guy from the robbery. His mind was playing tricks on him. The blackout in the van, the one just now. Maybe there was something wrong with him. Was he having a stroke? A voice from the food truck called out, John Smith, number two. The man turned and walked over to the pickup window of the truck. Half of his face was now fully visible to Nate. The profile, the shape of his head, and the way his nose sat a little too high on his face, leaving room for a tall mustache, were all very distinctive. It was definitely him. And yet, it couldn't be. Are you all right? Jennifer asked. Nate kept his eyes on the suspect. He took a deep breath and reached into his pocket for his phone. You see that guy over there picking up his dogs? He asked. Jennifer picked out the man he was referring to and nodded, then said aloud, Yes, when she realized Nate was intently focused on his target. I think that's one of the guys from the robbery. Are you sure? No, Nate said, but he was. I'm going to call it in. He glanced at his phone for a couple of seconds as he tapped on the shortcut for Max. 
When he looked back up, he found the fat guy staring directly at him. Their eyes met. The plate the fat guy was holding, loaded with a hot dog surrounded by handmade potato chips, fell to the ground. Nate stood. The man looked quickly around, then took off running at a speed Nate wouldn't have imagined the overweight man capable of. Hello? Nate? You there? Max said from the other end of the phone call. Nate ignored it and started after the heavyset man. But the first full step on the ankle he had tweaked earlier caused him to pull up in pain. He lost sight of the fat guy, then spotted him again heading toward a street where cars were parked. He took a few tentative steps, then did his best to give chase, running with a limp as each step felt like there was broken glass in between the bones of his ankle. He almost shouted, stop police, before remembering he was not currently active duty. Then he remembered the phone in his hand. He lifted it to his ear. Max, are you there? What the hell's going on? Max asked. One of the guys from the robbery. He's at the Soma food park. What are you talking about? The guys who shot me. I found one. Okay, you said you're at Soma? Yeah, the West End. He's got a beard now, lost a few pounds, but it's him. I'm sure of it. Looks like he's heading for a car. I'll alert any units in the area. Jeez, Nate, are you sure? What were you doing at Soma? Getting a hot dog. A hot dog? You? Long story. I'll bet 20 it includes a pretty professor. Are you all right? You sound like you're about to pass out. I twisted my ankle. Can't keep up with him. I still got eyes, but he's so far ahead. Then Nate noticed another figure rushing through the crowd ahead of him and catching up to the fat guy. It was Jennifer. Oh, shit, Nate said into the phone. What, is he gone? No, but Dr. Day thinks she's Cagney and Lacey today. My dream girl, Max commented. Nate took the phone away from his face and shouted after Jennifer. Day, let him go. But she was too far away to hear him. Then a group of people passed by, obscuring his view of the scene ahead. After they passed, he had lost sight of both of them. He continued limping toward the street, desperately scanning the crowd for Jennifer or the fat guy. He spotted Jennifer standing on the sidewalk next to a line of parked cars. One spot was conspicuously empty. She waved at him, then started walking toward him. What were you thinking? Nate asked her. I was thinking you were never going to catch him. Here, she added, handing him a sticky note with some letters and numbers written on it. That's his license plate number. Nate took the paper and looked at it. He lifted the phone back to his ear. Max, you still with me? I am. Sounds like you caught up to the prof. Yeah, she got a plate number. Got a pen? Shoot, Max said, then. Sorry, poor choice of words. Nate ignored the comment and read the letters and numbers off to Max. Mike, Romeo, 8, 2, 2, Echo, Echo. There was a moment of silence, then Max asked, Is this a joke? No, get a bolo on that plate. You're sure this is a license plate number? Nate looked to Jennifer. He held the phone between them and switched it to speaker mode. You got this right? He asked her. Jennifer nodded. Absolutely, I got a good long look at it. You heard her, Nate said on the phone. Why? My rabbit ate 22 Easter eggs, Max replied. What? Nate seemed confused. The phrase triggered a mental connection for Jennifer. Oh, like the memory trick Diane did for Jerry's license plate. And, Max added, the first thing you said to me after you woke up in the hospital. My rabbit ate 22 Easter eggs. Then Nate realized what they were getting at. The phrase was a mnemonic, a way of remembering a random sequence of letters and numbers by associating them with words in a sentence. The brain was much more likely to remember something like that than a straight-up license plate number. It was a trick he had used countless times on the job, and had even managed to get Max to make it a habit. My rabbit ate 22 Easter eggs. mr 8 22 E E. Jesus, Nate, what the hell? Max asked over the phone. Just put out the bolo, Nate said. Nate, take me off speaker. Nate switched back to handset mode and put the phone to his ear. What is it? He saw you? Max asked. Yeah, Nate confirmed. I'm going to send a unit to pick you up. Max, they're not going after me. Certainly not now. I'm not taking that chance. You may think it's all a big coincidence, but do you think they do? The guy they shot, a cop, just happens to run into them at a food truck. If they're smart, they'll leave town, Nate replied. Yeah, well, they haven't done that yet, so we can rule out them being smart. They're sticking around for some reason, and now they think you're onto them. What would your next move be? I don't need a police escort. They're not going to try anything here. I'm going to get the captain to put a unit outside your house. I insist. I don't think, hey, it's that or I'm sleeping on your couch tonight. All right, Nate sighed. And Nate, if you get any more weird thoughts or crazy urges, give me a call. Sure, Nate replied, relenting to his partner's pressure. 
He ended the call, then looked to Jennifer. He half expected her to give him a big, I told you so. But instead, she looked back at him with concern. Her phone rang. Jennifer looked at the screen, but didn't recognize the number. Now what? She answered it. Hello, this is Jennifer Day. Her expression changed from concern to worry, then something close to fear. All right, Diane, I'm with Detective Rainey. We can be there in half an hour. Are you safe? She listened for a moment. All right, we'll be there as soon as we can. It was Nate's turn to be curious. What was that? There was a gas leak at Diane's building. She says the ghost was there. Gas leak, huh? Henderson did a stint working for the gas company. I knew if we tweaked that guy, he'd make a mistake, but I didn't think it would happen so fast. I told her we'd be there as soon as we could. We'll have to come back at all the time for the hot dogs. A short woman, with literally fiery hair dyed yellow, orange, and red, walked up to Nate with a couple of cardboard-to-go boxes. You forgot these, she said with the voice of a woman who smoked too much and didn't care. Nate smiled at the sight of her. Thank you, Maddie. That wasn't necessary. Nobody walks away from my truck unsatisfied, she grunted. And what were you doing paying? You know your money's no good at my joint. You're the cook? Jennifer asked. Hey, sweetie, Maddie said to Jennifer, sizing her up with a maternally critical eye. Eat those before they get cold. Then she turned around and started trundling back to the art of the dog. Nate handed Jennifer one of the boxes. She's right. They taste best right off the grill. He started limping in the direction they left the van. How about you wait here and I pick you up? I promise I'll eat this on my way to the van. To fulfill her vow, she picked up her dog from the to-go container and bit off one end. She chewed for a moment, then her eyes widened as she continued chewing and swallowed. Oh my god, that is amazing. I thought you were getting the van, Nate said, taking a bite from his own dog. I'm going, I'm going. She took another bite and started walking. As she turned back to Nate and said, We are definitely coming back here when we don't have to chase after bad guys and ghosts. Deal, Nate answered with a grin. Thank you for listening to Near Death. A Rainy Day Investigation by Rich Hosek, Arnold Rudnick, and Lloyd Auerbach on the Bedtime Stories for Insomniac's Fiction Podcast. If you're enjoying this free presentation, I hope you'll post a review on Amazon, Goodreads, or Audible. That, and sharing this podcast with anyone you know who enjoys audiobooks, are the best ways to show your support. If you'd like to know more about the hosts of Bedtime Stories for Insomniacs and learn about my other novels, visit richhosick.com and stop by rainyanday.com for more information about this series. That's R-A-N-E-Y and D-A-Y-E dot com. Thanks again and all the very best. Seriously, if you can pop on over to podcastawards.com and help me out, that'd be great. Bedtime Stories for Insomniacs, Best Fiction, and Best Male Host. I owe you one.